thank you for joining us um, for this conversation about race and policing in a more international context. This is going to be the first of many Humanities Now conversations that we have planned for the year. Um, next month, we'll have Professor Elizabeth Brake in a discussion of what the ethical thing to do is. And in November, we'll talk to Tim Schroeder about ethics during a pandemic. Um, so you can register for these Humanities Now um, events on the Humanities Now page, but we will also be sending out emails as the dates approach. So today we're going to have a conversation with Professor Jacqueline Couty, the Lawrence H. Favreau Associate Professor of French Studies in the Department of Modern and Classical Literatures and Cultures, and the Associate Director of the Center um, for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Uh, I invited Dr. Kuti today for two reasons. First, in case some of you um, will not be able to attend the panel discussion this afternoon, which is at four. Um, and uh, second, to give you some background information as you head into the panel um, conversation today. So from my own conversations with friends and family members, um, people have been very surprised by the international response. Uh, to George Floyd's death and have asked me questions as a historian of, of the US. What does this mean? Um, what's happening? Why are other countries so interested in this story? And so um, we thought this was a wonderful opportunity to have a bit of a more free flowing conversation um, about this topic. So Dr. Kuti is going to present some information, but then we hope that this is going to be a broader dialogue uh, between all of us. So please be ready with your comments and questions. And again, um, uh, the School of Humanities is going to send out shirts to, to the folks who came today. So I'll capture your um, email addresses from the registration form and I'll be in touch about sending you some humanity shirts. So. Dr. Kuti, take it away. Thank you for having me today. Uh, so I will jump right in. I have like four or five points I would like to talk about today. France policy on race and looking at uh, legislature, talking about the difficulty, and I'm sorry, I have to get rid of my cat. <laughs> talking about the difficulty to collect ethnic data, and to talk about race in France, talking about police uh, immunity and looking quickly into immigration and then give you like three main examples of civil unrest uh, demonstrations, AKA riots um, concerning race in France. So for people who are dealing with France, issue of race and policing are not new at all. Since 2005, you have had major riots, what the media would call riots, and you know, other people would call demonstrations, though violent. Um, so in 2005, the central arrest followed the death of two young boys uh, of color who were chased by the police. And I will talk about that a bit more uh, in details. More recently, like Dr. Yarbrough's as, um, suggested, France has been looking at the US and the way the US have been protesting uh, racial discrimination and police violence. So marchers took to Paris streets on May 29, 2020 to denounce the official exoneration of three law officers accused of wrongdoing in the 2016 death of the 24-year-old Adama Traoré. He was in police uh, custody when he died. And I will be talking about that too. This would be one of my uh, examples. Four days later on June 2nd, demonstrators again took to the streets, uh, this time in major cities like Paris, Marseille, Lyon, and Lille. And I will be talking about those cities too, because those cities are the one where you will find the most immigrants from Africa, North Africa, and West Africa. And they were protesting, of course, police brutality, racism, and they were chanting 
and denouncing the death of both George Floyd and Adama Traoré. So while such public displays should feel familiar to many Americans, they also participate in a distinctly French tradition. Because race and racism belong to a global, to global systems and structure of oppression, the forum at 4 p.m. later today looks abroad as a mean to enhance participants' understanding of local and global expressions of prejudices. But today, to help you understand the conversations and discussion tonight, I will simply uh, concentrate on uh, a few little points to give you some social uh, historical background. And for that, I will first start with race policy in France. And the key word is colorblindness. So for those who are interested, uh, a lot of the topic I'm going to explore, I found in a, a very uh, well-researched article by Eric Black, and I put the information at the end in a bibliography, uh, a, biography for, a bibliography for you all. So what you need to know is that since the end of World War II, France has become very diverse uh, when you think about the ethnicity composing it. But unlike states or countries like the US, Canada, or also Great Britain, France has become uh, uh, maintained, in fact, a colorblind model of policy. There is almost no policies directly aimed at racial ethnic groups. France uses instead geographic or class criteria to address issues of social inequality. And we can see how this could become uh, a problem. If you look uh, at some of the bullet points that I put in the PowerPoint, uh, you can see, for instance, that a law from 1872 prohibits the French Republic from conducting a census by making any official differentiation uh, between citizens, be it race, gender, for instance. Uh, and this law derived from the French idea of universalism and also the model of, if I may say, the Declaration of the Right of Man and of the Citizen, which is very important to French people, which is a great idea. The problem is it doesn't really work well in daily lives. So for French people, and this is the ideal of universalism, every citizen, we all equal, and we are going to be all supported by the states. But de facto, it's not working like that. Already in the aftermath of the French Revolution, uh, aristocrat women like Olympe de Gouges was already critiquing the Declaration of the Right of Man and created the Declaration of the Right of Women uh, saying that this idea of universalism is not that inclusive. And, you know, so during this little talk, you have to keep in mind this ideal that France has of everyone is equal. And what, what is really happening when you have these new waves uh, of immigrants. And race, the word race is also a problem. So France has intentionally avoided any race conscious policies. There is no public policies that targets or benefits any groups defined as a race. And the main reason is again connected to the Second World War. For a lot of French people, and usually I would say the older generation, when you talk about race, they tend to recall the atrocities of Na Nazi Germany, who with the complexity of the complicity of French Vichy regime, deported thousands of Jewish individuals to concentration camps. And this is kind of a shameful history uh, that France share with uh, Germany. So because of that, history, the term and the concept of race is very problematic. 
So there's Arnold Law, and you could see also you know, on the PowerPoint, uh, a 1978 law specifically banning collection and attempt to computerize or store race-based data without the consent of interviewees. So scholars have to petition the National Council of Statistical Information, for instance, if they want to do research of race, because this is the fear that suddenly you could just, you know, take a group of people and deport them or mistreat them like French um, Vichy regime did with the Jewish population, which, is, which seems to be a good idea. But we'll see later on how it doesn't really work well for the new uh, immigrants being in France. So now, you know, you have those two councils. Uh, here you have National Council of Statistical Information, the National Commission of, on Information and Liberty, preventing scholars, everyone to uh, collect data. But, of course, uh, contrary to what people often think, ethnic statistics in France, they do exist uh, and they are collected and they are used against citizens. So it's not always difficult to collect data. So can you guess who or what group has access to the ethnic data and can use it without problems? So, you know, if you have some ideas, you could put it in the chat or you could join us if you want. Uh, you know, so normally in France, collecting data about race, ethnicities is almost impossible, but there's one group that can do it. So I will help you a little bit. Your higher suggested oh. the police. Yes! <laughs> the police. And, and then that's, that's very interesting and disturbing at the same time. And this is something which is also different from uh, the US because everyone has access uh, to ethnic, racial, or information or even about gender on different topics. In France, only the police can collect all of that. Uh, and here again, I, I will use the work of uh, Abdelali Ajat, and there's a very interesting article online, and I will put all of that at the end uh, of the PowerPoint, so you could like screenshot, copy, or send me an email, I will send you the information. And here's a quote uh, from uh, Abdelali that I, I love a lot, but it's very disturbing. Um, and I quote, one is not racist because one is a police officer, but one becomes a racist police officer. And he explains that basically you have two main ways to record information. One is the recorded offenses processing system, stick. The second one, the criminal records processing system, TAJ, all controlled by police forces. And they collect databases of several million people, victims or suspects, of offenses and they concentrate mainly on the suspect. And these two type of databases contain a racial filter, which is kind of interesting because for a country who is afraid of the word race, suddenly you have the police um, structure, the police forces who do have databases with a racial filter with 12 different types. I don't even think that in the US you are so, uh, you know, like picky about who is who. Uh, so you have whites and Caucasian. Then you have Mediterranean, meaning, you know, like people from Italy and closer to the Mediterranean because they're not French. Gypsy, so the people traveling, and already the term Gypsy is also a very negative one. Uh, Middle Eastern. North African, Asian or Euro-Asian, Amerindian, Indian from India, Mesoamerican, Black. So for Black, it's interesting. There's no, not a lot of different Blacks. It's just Black. Polynesian, Melanesian, Kanak. 
and that's it. And already, I think it's a big group uh, of people. Uh, so the police in France is very detailed. Now, in the reports, in the police reports, if you consult them, you will see that the term negroid type is used often. In other words, police forces use racial categories every day in their work. So how could they not become racist? Because the racial lens literally guide their interaction with people. And I think in the US is similar, but kind of there's some distinctions here. So it should not be surprising that law enforcement in French see the world through racial categories. Their job is about identifying and arresting suspects on the basis of racial types. And this is what we call daily de faciès, which is literally like, you know, your face is already a sign of your guilt, which is in, in, in the US we say racial uh, profiling. And here's another main difference between France's and United States police forces and why in France it's so difficult to go against the police. The French police and its different forces are linked to the centralization of power in France, meaning that there are national institutions and they belong to ministries. So when one challenges police brutality, one challenges the centralized state, France itself, because the police is under the umbrella of the French government. In the US, for instance, the police chief will be uh, chosen by the mayor and the mayor will be elected by the people, by the citizens. So then discussion of race locally with policing can be slightly different. So I think in Minneapolis, people are, have been trying to work at the local uh, level. Uh, so France, police forces, they are centralized, it's all about the states, but there are national forces, where in the US, they are decentralized and there's a bit more uh, flexibility. Then there's another way to talk about uh, race, is to look through immigrations. And then I will make a case that immigrants, the word immigrants will become a code word for non French, aka non-white. Uh, that's why uh, the idea of immigration is really important. So some more information here, what I talk about, you know, centralization of power. And here, uh, I want us to look quickly at those numbers uh, to realize that, and I think sometimes it's a problem in a lot of European countries, but also in the US. People are always, always have the feeling they're invaded by people from outside. So the INSEE is the French National Institute of Statistics. And in 2004, 85% of the population was from France, namely whites of European origins, then 10% was from North Africa, from Algeria, uh, for the Maghreb, so often Arab, but not always. 3.5 Blacks and 1.5 Asians. But when you look at the media, you have the feeling that whenever something bad happens, it's all those immigrants. Uh, but when you look at the percentage of them, they're not that numerous. And then I want us to realize that in the, really in the 85%, you also have black people who are French citizens. Because remember, it's a French law. You do not differentiate between French citizens depending on their race. But the minute people are immigrants, then it's a different story than you could use race. So that's why I wanted to show you that uh, immigration is an important way uh, to talk about race. What you have to remember also is this idea of the war. World War I killed a lot of young men, which means if you think in a cynical way, 
but a lot of labor disappeared. Then the Second World War did not do anything better, so a lot of lives were lost. Which means that after World War II and in the kind of reconstruction period in, in France, from 1945 to 1974, like immigrants were coming big way from Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Now, I want you to concentrate that the two main groups are from Asia, uh, meaning Vietnam and Cambodia. So think this is also the time where you have the Vietnam War in the US and most people are going to France because Vietnam, Cambodia was a part of a, a former French colony and North Africa, Algeria. And it's also the time where you're going to have the Algeri Algerian war in the sixties. So basically what's interesting is people start to come to France in the fifties and big ways in the sixties when you have all these big wars happening around the world in the decolonization of former European colonies. And, but the main influx is from Africa or globally from the Maghreb, North Africa, and also people from West Africa and Asia. So people always forget about Asia, but the group of Asian from Vietnam and Cambodia is also a big, a big group. Now, the Muslim population really started in 1974. And then the states who had economic problems wanted cheap labor, so allowed people from the Maghreb, in majority from Muslim um, belief, to come with their family. Before all these kind of uh, uh, immigrants I'm talking about, it, we were talking about like single men. Now you have whole family coming and you can imagine what kind of, suddenly French people have the feeling that their, you know, their life is changing. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, and, I, and that's why I wanted to talk quickly about immigration, not to bore you, but I think it's interesting. So I highlighted here the section on 2005 because I wanted you to see that in 2005, the new immigrants were from Europe. The highest number is from Europe. After that, you have Africa. After that, you have Asia. And we go down to America and Oceania. And all, all, of the, all the countries is you know, about 20, uh, 200 and, you know, 200K of amount of people, which is kind of a lot because France want to be a land for refugees, for helping people. But in the 1990s, new law, again, if you want to look at racism or race policing in, the, in France, you have to look at laws. I think maybe the same in the US. You have the Pasqua law and, uh, and the, this law changed the way French citizens were recognized. If before that, it was like, you were born in France, you're French. Now, since, uh, yeah, so it was 1998, not sure, I need to check my, uh, my dates, but the law basically, if your parents were not French and you were born in France, you could only become a French citizen when you turn 18. And you had to ask for it. If you didn't ask for it, you were not French, which is really, a uh, strange things to live, like 18 years, you're going to live in a country, you were born in this country for 18 years, but you do not belong. So this law is going to be changed later on, I think in 2005, but there are still some limitations to who uh, is French. So that's why nat nationality and race in France is very important. Uh, and that's why also the way you look could be problematic because though you're a French citizen, 
if you look like an immigrant, then there could be some racial profiling. And here I wanted quickly to talk about this idea of the myth of invasion uh, and how immigrants for me is a code word for non-white. So in France, there's only three really big cities with a lot of immigrants. Paris, of course, Lyon and Marseille. And then if you look at the number of the po po uh, population, which is like pa Paris itself, 2.2 million, and then Paris and its suburbs, 12 million of, uh, of people. So if you look uh, 2012, 38.2% of total immigrants lived in a Parisian urban sector, okay? And it's less in Lyon and Marseille. But among these immigrants, you also have European immigrants. They are not all from Africa. So I wanted us to think about this idea of perception versus a reality, you know? Um, I remember the, uh, the elections when the National Front were almost elected. Uh, you are like older lady from the countryside saying they're going to vote for them. So those older ladies from the French countryside, they've never seen any black people or people from North Africa. They were like, yeah, they're killing us because of what they saw on TV. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. So. When you go to Paris, if you go to the Quartier Chic, you will only see like wealthy people and white people. Uh, if you go to the suburbs, suddenly it's more diverse, but also more poor. Um, and then suddenly uh, you realize, oh, race like in the US is really connected to socioeconomics. And this is how the connections in fact with the US is going to be made. Because the people from the suburbs, whenever they see the police, they have a tendency to try to escape. And uh, you know they don't want to be a part of any kind of uh, interaction with the police. And they're like great movies. One of the main one is La Haine, Hatred. You could find it uh, in English. I'm sure it's in Canopy uh, at Fondren. It's a great movie. Very very sad, but it's literally about how a riot started because the police killed uh, a young man from uh, West Africa. So here is, is an example, and you could YouTube it, you could Google it. Uh, so what they call the 2005 French riots. When French people go for it, they go for it, meaning they burn things, they burn cars, they burn buildings. Uh, and they try, you know, they're not happy, you know about it. So that's why in France, they call it riots. In the US, when they use riots, I'm always confused. Uh, because, you know, most of the time, uh, protests in the US are very polite and, you know, it's all about love. In France, at least in 2005, it was not. So what happened, and it's kind of a tragic and very sad tragedy. So the police went to the suburb and a group of young kids, so the police who started to run because they didn't want to deal with them. And the police ran after them. Then three of these young youngsters, and I think they were between eight to 12. So they enter this kind of electricity substation, like, you know, this big electri electric, it looks like a little dome or, you know, where you have all those tubes on top of it. So they enter into that to hide, and two of them died electro uh, electrocuted. Uh, and so not only they die electrocuted, but their death created a blackout. So everyone knew that something wrong was happening. After that, you had three weeks of rioting throughout France. And when I mean rioting, it's like flipping cars, burning things, like bad. Uh, so that's the big one. But you, every two or three years, you do have some riotings too. Now, this one, I have to talk about that one, though it's also very upsetting. So 2017, two 
different events created a lot of social unrest. So Theo, he was arrested by the police. And while they were trying to restrain him, his pants fell down and one of the policemen baton ended up in his rear. So literally, he was raped by the police. It was sodomized. And it was on a video. So that, particularly for a black man, that literally angered a whole group of people. That other men will literally abuse another man uh, thinking this is not a problem. And you know, and I put alleged rape because when you read all the uh, media, all the information about that, you're just disgusted. You're like, dude, who does that? Who really took, you know, I don't know, in the US, do they have those long batons? Yeah, so just imagine, who does that, seriously? Uh, already like they, you know, they broke a lot of his limbs with it and then they did that. And right after that, you had a Chinese man who was killed by the police. So when you talk about race, uh, the misbehavior of police officers is not only on North Africans, Arabs, or black people, but also on Asian men. Uh, and I was talking to Dr. Yabro about that. A lot of the time, I don't know why, uh, it's the violence is on men. I haven't heard a lot about violence on women or women of color. So maybe kind of interesting to look uh, into that. So then more riots. And then the last one is the one I mentioned at the beginning. It's about Adama Traoré. So he was 24. He just got out of prison. And he, again, he was chased with the police so they were trying to see if he did not commit a crime of some sort. He got, he got arrested and then he died in custody. So we don't know what happened, but the police officer said they didn't do anything. Uh, so literally uh, in May, like for, you know, uh, the Breonna Taylor verdict, the three policemen were set free, nothing, you know, they were not accused of anything. So people started to march and to demonstrate. So those demonstrations were mostly uh, peaceful uh, so far. Uh, and again, Marseille, Lyon, and Lille, because those are the places where urban sectors have more, uh, if I may say, have more like immigrants or people from, whose parents were immigrants or people coming from the Caribbean or people who just like a vibe with, you know, a diverse group of people around you. And then for this demonstration, this is how literally we come back to, uh, you know, to a circle like race and racism and policing is a global problem. But sometimes we live in our country and we simply see our, uh, what's happening in our country with George Floyd, suddenly the French people are like, oh my gosh, we are doing the same thing because French people are always good to say that Americans are all racist because French people are not racist. It's always interesting to hear, oh, at least we're not American, we're not racist. So uh, yeah, I know. So it's always interesting to, to hear these kind of discourses. You know, we have universalism, all, all men are equal, so you have all those great ideas. But then the death of George Floyd was a kind of mirror where a lot of young French people who wants to change things, well, they saw a kind of reflection they didn't like in that mirror. And in fact, it was not simply in France, it was everywhere around, everywhere uh, around the world. So um, that was my little presentation. Uh, so I will stop, oh, no, because I've got, it's fancy. Uh, so this is what I promised. So you have the, the bibliography, so you could, uh, you know, screenshot it, take a picture of it, 
And if you want, I could also send you some information. So the two first ones, the three articles, first articles are in French, no, are in English. Everything else is in, is in French, sorry. Uh, but at least, you know, you have nice table that even if you don't speak French, you could still read. And I thought it would be interesting for you uh, to have that, to see where I found this information. Question, merci, thank you for your attention. So now I think, uh, you know, I'm ready for any questions uh, you may have for me. Okay. All right. So, oh, um, Yahaira has to leave. So we'll see you later. Thank you so much. This puts a lot of pressure on you, Taylor. <laughs> 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 to talk to us about uh, Dr. Kuti's presentation. So I have a ton of questions. This, I mean, this is so interesting to me. So um, an easy question, is there a French equivalent of Fox News? Because you were talking about how the old, older French women are out in the countryside and they see all these images and so they're, they're voting based on this idea that immigrants are a problem. And, and so I just wondered if there's a kind of French equivalent of a Fox News that's giving a particular perspective to those folks in the countryside. Yes, uh, really enough, until the 1990s, television was a state affair. It was under the national uh, government. So it was what we call public television, like PBS, but it really meant that it was, you know, under the Ministry of France itself. So after that, it was uh, privatized. And suddenly when all these private channels happened, a lot of nonsense started also uh, to be uh, presented. And now if you look on TV, there's a lot of shows talking about race uh, in a way which is so disturbing, um, particularly uh, for Americans. So for instance, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, two scholars, researchers, French researchers were on TV, uh, you know, but again, one of those kind of private channels and were like, yes, you know, we, whenever there are vaccines, we need to try this vaccine on prostitutes in Africa. Africa is the best place for that. And then the backlash was immediate. So that's the beauty with social media. Social media, everyone is in your business, but then when you say something which is really horrific, everyone shames you. So when they were talking about that on TV, they did not see why such a comment was problematic. Already, I'm sorry, prostitutes are people, so they should not be used as, you know, kind of experiment objects. And then to decide, let's just go to Africa, where people have been doing better with the pandemics than a lot of European countries, by the way. So let's just use them to experiment. That's kind of horrible things to say. Uh, and that's on TV. I mean, national TV, people see this. Uh, or you have, it was in a show, I couldn't watch this whole, the whole thing. Uh, someone posted that on uh, Twitter and I was just like, so you, have this, so you have this group of men who are always talking about, you know, we're not racist, people are just too touchy. And then this guy was like, basically, uh, like people of color should not monopolize race or the fight against race. It's not about them. It's about us, white people. We need to get together and work on that. So I don't see why they're always like in groups and doing all of that. And I'm like, what? Uh, so because they need some group needs to be in the middle of everything, which is, yes, I agree. It's a great idea that, you know, a group of white men, mostly old, but they get together and they get enlightened. That's nice. But we can't, our role is to show what is the problem. Because if we don't tell them, oh, I'm sorry, the way you behave was bad, they will keep on doing it. 
So that's why for me, like the TV, social media is problematic. Sometimes you have better information depending where you look uh, on social media, Twitter, Instagram, or whatever. Because on TV, it's like, I was about to say something bad, like TV, uh, French TV has been Americanized. So all these kind of TV reality shows in the US, the worst ones, you find them in France. And, and they're even worse and more crass uh, in France. And of course, people, you know, TV is the option for the masses. So people look at TV and have particular ideas of Americans, for instance, because, you know, of course, they're all racist, but French people are not. Uh, they have particular visions of people from Africa, they're all poor and then, you know, they don't wear shoes, uh, you know, and they only have prostitutes there. So, yeah, the, med the media can be problematic uh, in a way, but I think it's just a global issue too. People just want easy information they can digest. Do you think, um, it's interesting to me, this idea of um, not collecting information on race. Mm -hmm. And so I am very curious about if you think the situation in France would improve if they collected information about race. I think if they start to do that, but I mean, you have two groups uh, that kind of uh, oppose the collection of it. And, and one group, which is like, yes. Uh, so the memory of the Shoah, of Second World War, what happened to Jewish individuals. So I can understand why they would think, oh, collecting information could be dangerous because people could be mistreated because of that. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have access to this information, then we don't know, it's hard to calculate uh, or to measure mm -hmm. the problem with discrimination, be it gender discrimination, uh, race discrimination, uh, I mean, it's mathematical. If you don't have numbers and data, you cannot do it. Okay. So, and you know, in, in the US we've been, I think we've been working uh, well into using the data to show, because people are like, oh no, we're not, you know, we love everyone. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not, uh, yeah, oh uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's an interesting question because the, on the other hand, as a historian, I can see how the collection of the data in the past is not good either for race relations, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's just trying to find the, the right balance. Yeah. And I think the Me Too movement is a different part of that because again, you know, right now, with this question of gender, uh, you know, how are you going to talk about discrimination if you don't always have the data and all the information about that? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if you notice, it's only the, the both of us now. Which is fine. We can continue with our, <laughs> with our conversation. It'll be posted for other people to see at their leisure. Um, I'm also um, interested in why you think, so, you mentioned that that George Floyd's murder was like, like a mirror, right? Mm -hmm. And that the French population sees what's going on and then connects it to events there. Um, so two things. George Floyd isn't the first person in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that captured a lot of attention. So I wonder if you think there's some reason why George Floyd in particular at this moment but then the other thing I'm struck by is when you're talking about Adama Traore, I had never heard about that before. And, and what do you think it means that the United States doesn't pay attention to things that are happening in other places and see that also as a mirror? Do you see what I mean? Yes. That the French immediately, the, you know, the population immediately you know, sees the, the cell phone video and says, aha, but it's interesting that it's this particular moment, you know, for instance, um, 
I'm guessing similar reaction wasn't there for like Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown or right. And so I'm just wondering what you think makes this particular moment. And maybe even if you have an idea of why it makes this particular moment, um, what made this particular moment so striking in the US, but also what does it say about the United States? What does it say about Americans that we don't see what's happening in other places and draw similar connections? I mean, again, to answer one part of, uh, uh, you know, of your question is the media. <laughs> you know, how would you know what's happening in France if you don't go to international media? Because, I mean, local news or international news can barely cover what's happening in the U.S. Sometimes if I want to have a better idea of what's happening in the U.S., I'm going to the BBC uh, or to France to, you know, to have a broader vision of things. So Americans who are, for instance, on Twitter or social media may have the opportunity to see different things because they're different kind of groups. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you saw this uh, presentation in uh, August 28 by Dr. Uh, I think Fluke. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, that was that was fabulous. And uh, I remember he quoted or paraphrase, uh, paraphrase uh, Martin Luther King uh, saying uh, that you know we need to look at race in a global way. So it's interesting that, and think about it, in the 1930s, 1940s, it was all about black internationalisms. A lot of African-American were in Paris. You had a lot of that dialogue between Africans, uh, people from the French Caribbean who moved to Paris, and African-Americans. So at that time, they were all tight, and they knew what was happening. So I think that's why I wanted to do the forum today because I wanted to remind us of this old black internationalism uh, that Martin Luther King uh, was talking about. That you know we have a small house and now we have a big house and the big house is the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Fluke was also talking about uh, we're in. A, is it? He didn't say a world of death. Uh, we're in culture, but, but I think we are kind of living in the culture of death. Uh, and this culture of death in the US, I've, I think I've numbed a lot of people. Mm. I really believe that the pandemic is a part of it. So, so you have a lot of people just being at home, being afraid of, of dying, being afraid of a lot of things. And then realizing that, hey, you don't really need to have a pandemic to die. If you're black and you run, you'll be dead. Uh, if you're black and you go to a store and the storekeeper thinks that you give him like $20 bill that's fake, we don't even know if this is a, you will die. Uh, if you sleep, you will die. Uh, so French people suddenly that it's, because again, before uh, George Floyd, you, I forgot his name, but you have the runner, you have several ones, who died before. Oh, German Arbery. Yes. You know, like, even before, it seems that, this is what I'm seeing the media, all of those people who died since the beginning of January, that we heard about it like three or four months later because of the activism of a lot of people. Then, this is a good part of the media. George Floyd, and I did not watch it because I believe in respected the body of the dead or corpses. Like a lot of people have watched his video. For me, there's nothing more obscene than watching someone who is dying and calling for his mother. And I think this is, and this is it. It's just like at one point you have to look yourself in a mirror and be like, if that does not move me, what will? What kind of person are you to not only watch that and to be like, mm -hmm. I don't need to watch this video to be appalled and totally traumatized by the death of this man. And on top of that, he had also uh, the COVID. So, so I think it's the perfect storm 
-hmm. And I think it's the culture of death going way too far. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't know who said that. The, is it the future of the end will be televised? It was some... <laughs> the revolution will be televised. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Literally, this is what we're living. Like, you know, you watch that and you're like, so you even do something or you don't? Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's like, you know, for Breonna Taylor, the mayor of Lexington uh, in Kentucky, it was like, people keep calm. You know, you, you do something, you die, you keep dying, uh, you know, you, you're calm, you die. So you, you may choose you to do something about it when there's a reason for your death. Uh, so I really think for me, George Floyd's death is about a shift in the kind of Cartesian discourse, like this kind of rationality that, you know, everyone has been embracing since, you know, the Renaissance of the Enlightenment is all about the reason. His death didn't make any reason whatsoever, uh, didn't make any sense, and his death called us to the deepest feelings, literally. So it wasn't about looking at this and be like, well, this is what happened. It's like, whoa. Yeah. And so I think that's why, uh, and also guilt, <laughs> a lot of guilt. Uh, and you know, white guilt, black guilt, a lot of guilt. Because a lot of people have privileges, no matter their colors, different levels but it's like wow mm -hmm. literally if this happened to him it could happen to any one mm -hmm. and of course the police impunity like already in france people don't like the police literally since the 1960s there's tension uh, mm -hmm. i mean like if you pulled over you could like yell at the guy spit at his face um nothing will happen to you for the past five years it's different because the French government, we used to be centrist, is mm -hmm. slowly uh, going, in fact, to the right. Uh, and police forces are more and more uh, protected. But because for French people, they're like a part of the state, whatever, they're here to serve. Uh, so there's not the same respect for police that you have in the US, which is kind of strange. Hmm. So I think also, uh, I forgot about the, because there, see, there's so many. So this black man was selling uh, cigarettes in New York. Oh yeah. So already that was already bad enough and that made big waves. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, when is it gonna stop? So I think that's why Josh Floyd, I don't think it's Josh Floyd per se. It's just like, seriously. And then you have the list and you're like, so you haven't reacted for him and reacted for her when are you going to react mm -hmm. so uh i think it's uh, it's layered yeah. it's a lot of different things but i mean even my mom i mean you know if i'm like using whatsapp to talk to my mom she's like, oh my god did you see on tv what happened to that man and i'm like um mom i live in the us yes i do uh because she lives in the french caribbean so uh -huh. if you can talk to me about george floyd Breonna taylor all those things happening, okay. then I have to ask myself, ooh, where did she find this? Yeah. Because again, on WhatsApp, you also have little videos turning. Okay. Yeah, so people learn about things. So sometimes my mom sometimes knows things in the US before me. I'm like, what? So this is the beauty of social media when it works well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, well, I really appreciate you talking to us today. Um, I'm going to stop.